first things first, all property management agreements must be in writing from the beginning, from the inception. There's no such thing as an oral property management agreement. The only time we have an oral agreement is with a buyer's agency agreement, okay? It has to be in writing. So what do we have to have in there? What's important? Obviously, we need the property description. Now, in this particular case, in property management, the street address is fine. But if we have a legal description, that's fine too, all right? So you can use either one. You can have a contract period. Now, a property management contract is the only one that can automatically renew, okay? It's the only one that can automatically renew in the event that we have overlapping time frames. If my contract ends in November and I just put a client in there who's good till next February, well, don't I want to collect my fee until February? If my contract runs out in November, then I might not be able to collect it. So I want that to renew to cover at least some court coverage for the clients I put in. Um, how are we going to pay the management fee? Is it going to be a percentage of the gross? Is it going to be um, you know a, a flat salary? Is what's it going to be? Is it going to be um, you know anything else? Right? How are we going to get paid? What's our management fee? What do they expect us to do, right? And this comes through a discussion. Yes, we're going to have some boilerplate stuff that we're going to do, but we also need to know what the owner wants us to do, all right? Sometimes owners are hands-on, sometimes not. Sometimes you don't even know them. What's our authority? How much, right? Can we set rental, set rental rates? Can we hire vendors? Can we fire vendors, right? What about um, if we need to um, pay the HOA? Does this, the owner want to pay the uh, homeowner or the property owners association directly, or does he want us to pay them? What about all kinds of bills that come in? Does he want us to pay them and just send them the net, or does he want us to handle a gross? All of that, all right? We have to discuss that right up front. What about credit checks, if we're doing credit checks? If we're doing credit checks, um, do, does the owner want approval, or do, is it okay for the property manager to approve? Usually the owner wants approval of a credit check, right? Make sure somebody can pay. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, all right? But we have to discuss that. How about reporting? Obviously, I have to do monthly reports, right? Quarterly profits and losses, annual budgeting, all those things, right? I, I can't just mail them a check or, God forbid, you have to ask them for more money because the rents didn't cover the expenses that month, right? That is not a pleasant time. So that happens once in a while. You got no rents or low rents and you got a lot of expenses. Sometimes you got to call the owner and say, hey, can you send me some money? Write me a check. We got to replace the television, right? Something like that. And then, you know, so that's reporting. How do we do these statements? What are we doing? How often do they want them? What are the responsibilities of the owner? How much leeway are you going to give me to do my job? Are you going to be very hands-on? You're going to watch me every second? That's okay. I can deal with that. But... I'm going to expect you to do that, right? So I need to know that. What's going to happen when we terminate? What's going to happen with those leftover tenants that I still should get paid for, right? What do you want? Am I going to return this over to somebody else? Are you going to um, uh, take over yourself? What's what's going to happen at termination, right? How are we going to get paid? What if you terminate us early? What's the fees going to be? We also have some miscellaneous provisions, right? How are we going to make deposits into the owner's account? We're going to put the, the the proceeds into the owner's account, and then we're going to pay everything out, and then we'll send him the money. How often does he want it? We have to talk about entry into units. We're not allowed to just walk in and barge into anybody's unit, right? How often does he want us to inspect it? Some folks do it quarterly. Some folks do it every six months. You're going to do it when you move in. They're going to do it when you move out. Usually, you're going to do a video inspection right? Make sure there's no damage. How often do we get in? Right. And if that building was built before 1978, we have to do what? Keep in mind, if it's built before 1978, if you think back to our environmental issues, even if they're a renter, you still have to do a disclosure. Lead-based paint disclosures are, good, are for both buyers and renters. Okay. Buyers and renters. So we have to disclose those. We have to make sure we do that. You know? How do we terminate? How do we terminate? Who's going to be responsible for taking those people to the court? You want me to do that? That's something that, you know, unfortunately, property managers do all the time. 
they file the interpleaders, they file the court cases, they file the eviction ter- notices, all of those. Does he got to give us 30-day notice, 60-day notice? Should be in there. Now, understand this in the red here. If that property is destroyed, hurricane, flood, fire, whatever, our contract's terminated. There's nothing to, to release. It's to terminate it if it, the property is destroyed. Really? If it gets wiped out or whatever by fire, I got nothing to rent. So I can't manage the property. There's nothing there. So sticking with property management duties, we're going to prepare this management plan. This is what we're going to do for you. This is what we expect out of you, right? And then we're going to market the property. If I have the best condos or the best rental units out there and they're high class and they're clean and they're desirable, can I charge higher rent? Sure. But if the brand new building down the street becomes better than ours, am I going to lose some of my rent and some of my rentability? So I have to maintain that. I got to find out what that level is. I have to be very familiar with the, everything around me. What's happening here? What's happening to the neighborhood? So those are the things that we kind of have to take stock of. I'm going to qualify tenants too. We're going to select them as a property manager. Now in red here, this is important. Federal Fair Housing Act uh, prefers the most weight be given to the credit and employment history. However, criminal background checks are legally allowed. Screening process must be the same for all applicants. You cannot pick and choose who you give a credit report to you can, or get from. You can't pick and choose who the employment history is from. You definitely can't pick and choose how criminal background checks. You either do it for one or you don't do it for anybody. You don't usually do it for everybody or you don't do it for anybody. Okay? You cannot pick and choose, right? That would be a fair housing violation, and you'll end up with a bigger headache than just being a property manager. Okay. You don't want to practice that. Not a bit, not a good habit. So we're also going to collect rents and security deposits. We're going to get all of those things. Maintain the property. That's one of our M&Ms, right? Maximize revenue, maintain the property. We'll make sure we're bringing in the most money we could possibly get. If we're at 100% not, no vacancy, if we're at 100% rental rate, are we charging enough money? You got to ask yourself that question. Because there should be some, but maybe we're not uh, we're not as uh, getting as much revenue as we should be getting. So we bump it up a little bit. We got to see where that threshold is. Where do we start getting to that five or six percent rental vacancy? You got to figure that out. Because then I know that I got at least some resistance to what I'm charging. But I'm if I'm at a hundred percent filled every day all the time, I'm probably not charging enough money. Right, and that's how you do. That's how you kind of figure out where those rates are. I got to bump them up a little bit. Really? And this is why you're paying um, huge amounts for hotel bills now. People are traveling, huge amount for hotel bills, huge amount for plane. They're selling every seat, so they're trying to find out where the maximum is. Where's that push? We're going to keep going, right? And we keep paying it because we want to travel. We're so travel desirous right now because we are locked up for two years. Right? Everything's trying to push out. Last point there, initiating eviction procedures. Yeah, you got to do the ugly work too if you're a property manager, right? Neither one of them will be happy about that. That's an ugly day. That's an ugly day. So when you got to try to get somebody out, it never ends nicely, never ends pleasantly. Um, It's a tough part of the job. More accurate records. We got to keep accurate records. We have to do um, annuals, right? Annual... um, Budgets, we got to do income and expense reports. We have to do profit and losses. Um, what are our legal duties? What do we have? What can we say? What can we do? We have to do all of that stuff. Tenant eviction, another one we just, well, we just talked about that. Now, when we're doing commercial properties, multiple properties, right? We have to apply to both the Americans with Disabilities Act and the fair housing laws. So the Americans with Disabilities Act is more public accommodations than fair housing. Fair housing has to do with the homes, right? If we live in a condo complex, and remember I said we own our unit, right? We own that in severalty. But the swimming pool, right? The swimming pool, which is a common area, if that's public area, that falls under the Americans with Disabilities Act. It doesn't fall under fair housing. So fair housing would cover my condo, 
Americans with Disabilities Act for public com uh, accommodations, which cover the swimming pool. So as a property manager, you got to be familiar with both of those, the ADA. How do we access around? Do we have one of those um, uh, remote chairs that will lower people into the pool and get them out, right, if they're handicapped? Do we have locks on the gates to make sure it's safe? All of those things, right? So fair housing governs the residents. ADA governs common areas and commercial properties. And everybody has to have fair and equal access. Everybody. Right. Everybody. Under a property management agreement, the broker is not authorized to advertise the property for sale or negotiate the sale. All right. This is our, remember I said there were, when we talked about the antitrust laws, when we talked way back in chapter five about antitrust laws, we said that you couldn't price fix, you couldn't boycott, you couldn't allocate customers and you couldn't allocate markets. And I said there was a fifth one and it had to do with property management. And this is that. This is an illegal tie-in agreement. What that means is that I can't, in this particular case, I can't say to the owner, I will manage your property if when you go to sell it, you sell it through our company. And we'll add that right to our lease. We'll make sure it's in writing. That's an illegal tie-in agreement. I can't tie him in. He's allowed to sell his property with anybody he wishes, all right? So if he wants to sell it with us, we need a separate listing agreement. We can't just add it into the lease or the leasing agreement, the management agreement, okay? That would be an illegal tie-in agreement. We can't let them do that. So if they want to rent it through us we're, and we're the property manager, we're happy to help them. But we can't say we'll only do it if you sell it. If when you go to sell it, you sell it to our company. That's not the case. That's, uh, that's illegal. That's an antitrust violation. Remember that the anti federal antitrust violations could also be called the Sherman Clayton Acts or the Sherman Acts. I've seen them all, all of those. It's all the same. What if I am a, um, if I'm a doing commercial business? A lot of property management is in commercial business, right? Uh, what if I have a tenant who says, I'll lease your 50,000 square feet, but I want to put offices in there and this is just an open, it's just an open area. Can we add that? We can handle the upfitting, put a few offices in, ask how much you need. And inside the building, we can put, you know, we can put walls up and beams and we can put cubicles or whatever in there. We could do that. That's an upfit. Let's make it fit the property. What if we, if there's no doors or windows outside, but we have a trucking company, do we need loading docks? Maybe we need to put a loading dock in, right? That kind of thing. Maybe we need to put, um, uh, places for storage inside there, racking systems up so that we can put pallets up there, right, for storage. That's an upfit. We're changing the building to fit the tenant. Okay. That works all the time also, right, changing the building. Investments, we're going to talk about this is what your owner is looking for. The cash flow is spendable income. That's what they get, okay? That's what they get. Now, if you remember when we talked in chapter 17, we said our gross, um, our gross income, right, minus our operating expenses is going to give us our net operating income, okay? But then we said that we were going to take debt service off of after we got the net operating income. So minus debt service, right, that's going to give us our cash flow. That's what we can go to the bank with, all right? And that's what your that's what your owner is looking for. Gross income minus our operating expenses is going to give us our net operating income. Then we're going to take off what it costs for mortgage and interest. That's our debt service, okay? We're going to take that off after our net. Once we take that off, then it becomes cash flow. And cash flow is... Money I'm bringing to the bank. Okay. That's how it's figured out. Mm -hmm. So really it's no, no more complicated than that. Leverage, leverage. You hear about new owners of, you know, owners of um, sports teams and things of that nature. Derek Jeter was a shortstop for the New York Yankees. Hall of Fame shortstop, well-deserved, excellent talent. He retired. And he invests in the Miami Marlins. 
and he buys a piece of the Miami Marlins and they make him president of the company. Make him president of the Miami Marlins. Now he has since he has since given up that position. But you would think that if somebody made you president of the Miami Marlins, you would have a pretty big ownership stake in there, right? He owned 2%. He owned 2%. So when we hear somebody who's like the, the, the majority shareholder, it doesn't mean he's got a lot. Usually what happens is somebody who's got a majority share will own 51%. But it's voting stock. So that means who's got to be this 51%? He doesn't have to own more than that unless he's looking to make money on it. But Jeter owned 2%. And they, so, and they had a bunch of people own bits and pieces of it more. I mean, nobody else musters up billions of dollars to buy these sports franchises, right? Um, same thing with, like, when you talk about Amazon. Bezos owns stock, but he doesn't own all the stock. He owns the majority of the stock, and that's what makes him worth, uh, you know, all of that money. Elon Musk, all these people that you talk about have king-size riches. They don't own all of it, right? They have leverage. Um, Musk paid $44 billion for Twitter. Right? That's what he paid for it. Of that money, he borrowed $23 billion. He borrowed it. He's using leverage. Right? He put up some of his money, but he's really, that's the only money he's put at risk. The rest is all leverage money. Other investors, things of that nature. Right? He borrowed that money. He got investors for it. Right? For it. And that's, so that's leverage. That's using other people's money to make a purchase. If you get a, mar a mortgage, you live in a nice house. You know, that's not your money. You didn't put all of that money up. You put 20% up, maybe. But you borrow the rest. You have leverage for that, right? And now as it's growing equity, it's growing bit more, your leverage, your cost of leverage is going down. Your mortgage is going down. You're paying it off, and it's a smaller percentage of what you own. So again, using other people's money or using bank money or using borrowed money helps you gain accesses, right? So that's what you do in a, to finance those investments. Equity buildups, obviously by appreciation over time, right? Houses get more valuable. Property gets more valuable over a long period of time. It has its up and down. Stock market, same thing. It's got its up and down. But over time, it keeps up with inflation, all right? Debt service we talked about, you're going to pay your mortgage and you're going to pay your interest. And every time you make a mortgage payment, what happens to your principal? It goes down a little bit, right? You gain more equity. You gain more value. Really? And then if you make capital improvements, maybe you put a new roof on the house. Maybe people will pay more money for it, right? Maybe, um, you know, whatever you do to make improvements, better driveways, better sidewalks, you know, just painting, cap uh, put a garage on that you didn't have. All those things are capital improvements, right? You've increased the value of the property. There you go. You've added to the, your equity. You made it more valuable. Mm -hmm. So all of those things are part of your equity buildup. Now, we are always got to look for what's our percentage of profit, right? Everybody knows that they are always looking for their slice of the pie, whatever that is. But it's pretty easy to figure out percentage of the profit. And there are some questions in your math packet, but this is kind of easy stuff. I'm hoping you understand it. If I bought something for $100,000 100, and I sold it for $125,000, that means I made, I made what? I made $25,000, right? Pretty simple math, okay? If I divide it by what I paid for it, that means I made 25% on my investment, right? I got my 100 back, which may be even, and then I made 25,000 more, which made me a 25% return on investment. Over time, that's not a terrible investment, right? Not a terrible investment. Then that's really how, that's as simple as it gets. Doesn't get much more complicated than that. Now, Talking about all of that cash flow and all of those things, we're going to have to create an annual operating budget. And we're going to have to use uh, return on investment is not necessarily uh, not necessarily a capital gain. It depends. We're going to talk in chapter A18. We'll talk about capital gains in a, in a few minutes. Your equity could be a capital gain if you sell it, right? But your annual return on investment may or may not be. Okay, may or may not be. Um, so we're going to have to, as property managers, do an op annual operating budget. Is there going to be, if I don't have a single renter in a unit, is it going to cost me money to own, to, to own that unit? Yeah, 
those are fixed costs, right? I got to pay for the insurance. I got to pay the taxes on the building. I got to pay for, um, um, you know, HOA fees, right? I got to pay for, you know, anything, general maintenance of the building, anything that happens. So all of those things are fixed costs. Whether there's a person in there or not, I'm going to have to pay those things. So we're going to have to figure out a budget with that. And then we're going to have to figure out what our variable cost is. If I don't have anybody in the unit, my electricity bill is going to be pretty low, right? I could probably keep the electricity off. Got to keep the refrigerator running and uh, some of the other to heat on. That's pretty easy. But if I put a family in there at the beachfront and they're going to stay there for a week, what's going to happen to my electricity bill? Do you, do you know of a single family that doesn't crank down the air conditioner to about 40, put ice on the windows, and shuts a light off? I don't think so. They don't exist, those families. You know who I'm talking about, right? So that means your heat bill, your electric bill is going to go through the roof. You're going to pay for more electricity. They're always going to leave that balcony door open, right? Even though it's like um, 100 degrees outside, they got the air conditioner cranked down. They'll be cool. And then all the sheets get damp and wet. Did you ever do that? Open up the balcony door and then the sheets get all damp and humid. And that happens. When you put people in there, dynamics change. There's a reason why those beachfront condos have some of that junkiest furniture out there, that wicker white, hard and uncomfortable furniture there is, because nobody takes care of it, right? If I had to change the furniture every time, you know, a family came in there and put sand and everything else in there, are vacation condos built for comfort inside the unit? No. You're there to sleep. You're there to change clothes. You're there to shower if you must. And then you're there to get out, go to the beach, go enjoy the environment, right? You're enjoying the sizzle. So all of those things cost money when they come back. So we have to figure that out. We have to fall back into our operating budget and say, okay, we have to figure out X amount of vacancy. We got to figure out how much we can charge. What's our break-even point? Where do we have to go up and down? All right. How much cash are we going to have to get over a period of time? Now, if I'm doing an annual bar operating budget, I'm going to have to do it for a year on a monthly basis. We have to figure all those things out. What's it cost? We're going to look for history. We're going to look for past trends, obviously. And we're going to have to do it. If we know inflation's running at 5 or 6%, we got to take all of our costs from last year and multiply them by 5 or 6%. Kind of get in the ballpark. Second paragraph here says, when establishing rates for an income-producing property, property managers should give the most consideration to a market analysis of neighboring competitive properties. Remember what I said before? If your neighbors are starting to get really good, and you don't keep up with the Joneses, where are you going to lose your business to? You're going to lose them to your competitive, pop competitive properties, right? You're going to lose. Maybe they start charging less. Or maybe you're charging too much, and they can find the same thing or better over there. Or they're charging more. Maybe now it's time for you to boost your prices. You need to know what's going on all around you. You need to know what's going on all around you when you're the property manager. Okay. You have to be able to handle all of those things. A property manager's primary responsibility, true or false, is to preserve the value of an investment property while generating uh, income for the property owner. The answer technically is false. This is the definition of the primary function. Our responsibility is to realize the highest return on the property that is consistent with the owner's instruction. Our function is to what? Maintain value, maintain the unit, and maximize value, which is what we're talking about up here. So that's our job, right? M&M. &M. And then we have a responsibility to get the highest return. Okay. I know it's parsing words, and I don't particularly agree. I'm not crazy about the way they do that, but Unfortunately, that's the way the commission writes it out. That's the way they test on it. I'm telling you what they do. Three. All right. So we know what the percent of profit is. We've kind of done this, right? So it is to provide a uh, profit divided by the original purchase price. So if we made $25,000 on a $150,000 purchase, we got 17% profit. Okay. I'm going to jump right into Chapter 13's insurance. It's going to take us two minutes to do this chapter, and we'll do the others too. Chapter 13 in your book is property insurance. Now, I might have told you this already, but 
I have been married to somebody who's got 30 years in the insurance industry. She's very, very good at what she does. If you ask me about insurance, the answer you're going to get is her phone number. All right. I don't deal in insurance when I have a, a, a block of granite who is doing this for so long. Plus, I don't like insurance. Let's be, to be completely honest. Insurance is one of those necessary evils. Sometimes it turns in your favor. Most times it does not. Every time you got $5 in the bank, they want 10. But it's a necessary evil. It's one of those things that we have to have. And particularly if you live by the shore, in addition to um, having house insurance or home insurance, you need what? Wind and hail insurance. You need flood insurance. You need all of those things for your property, right? In addition to just the regular property insurance. The first thing we got to talk about are things that are covered. Fire, lightning, windstorm, hail, glass breakage, explosion, riot, civil commotion, damage by aircraft, vehicles, smoke. All these things are insurable. Vandalism, malicious theft, and uh, malicious mischief, theft, right? Loss of property removed from the premises when it's endangered by fire or other perils. Firemen come in and putting out the fire. Are they worried about your cashmere uh, blanket that's on your couch? They're not even worried about your couch. Their job is to put the fire out, right? That's what you want them to do. Some things are going to get damaged. So you, that other stuff is coverable by insurance. And that's what we need it for. You cover all of these things. And right? you're just happy that the firemen showed up and put out the fire. Things get broken. Collateral damage is what they call it. Mm -hmm. So... We have three different types of policies that we are going to talk about. And they all kind of fall under the same umbrella, so we're only going to talk about the issues. HO3, an HO3 policy is the most common one. That is your minimum coverage mortgage lender homeowner insurance. When, when you get a mortgage, they're going to require you to be insured. They are going to act, uh, they're going to make you buy purchase. If it's a home, you're going to have an HO3 policy. If it's a condo, they're going to require an HO6 policy. All right. So if you have a mortgage, they're going to require you to have insurance. Now, HL4 is renter's coverage. It covers your personal property. Not a bad idea. It's not very expensive. And actually, an HO6 is a walls in ownership. And renter's coverage and condo coverage are pretty inexpensive. All right. The one that's going to be up there. Now, the one that's really more costly is a flood insurance policy. And we'll get there in a minute. All right. We'll talk about those. I'm sure we have some people, you don't have to admit this. I'm sure that we have some people in here in this classroom, that insurance shop. We're always trying to move from insurance company to insurance company, try to get the lowest price. Right. And we think that if we make a claim on one company that we are going to go into another company and they won't know about it. Right. They won't know about it. Well, there's such a thing out there as what's called a LexisNexis report, okay? Or a clue report. You'll hear it for both. This LexisNexis report, if you file a claim on anything, it's going in that report. So if you don't think that the Gecko or Flow don't know, even though they're giving you a cheap price this year, you don't think they know already what kind of um, claims you make? They know. They look you up on this Nexus, LexisNexis. Or this clue report. They know your car claims. They know your house claims. It's all out there. So they might give you a low rate now, but wait until your renewal. Or God forbid you make a claim. And then watch what your rate is. All right? You know, the upside of that is if you make a claim, it is going to um, bounce up pretty significantly. So it's all knowledgeable. You're not hiding anything. And it says that a property or owner's claims history may make a property or policy holder uninsurable or insurable only with very high premiums. I know that some of you might have uh, driving age children. What if they owned a Camaro? If they were 20 years old and owned a Camaro, um, what would their insurance rate be? Anyway, I, I mean, it would be through the roof. Um, but if I was 65 years old and I had a Camaro, would I be paying the same thing? No, right? Because I'm very danger averse. Or, you know, anybody who's that age, just as you get older, I used to have friends who think it was very cool to go 100 miles an hour. And I would ask them, and I even my younger days, I would ask them, well, you're going to pay for that. That's fine. But how many times are you going to do 100 miles an hour? 
If you do it for a normal habit, you are not going to have your driver's license long and you might get hurt, right? Or worse. So if it's not a common thing, the novelty will wear off relatively quickly. You know, we have to weigh all these things because if you get caught in a, a traffic or a traffic stop doing over, you know, uh, doing 100, they might not even insure you anymore, which then revoke your license, do we put you into careless driving, um, all kinds of stuff. And it becomes very, very expensive. So same thing with the person who makes constant homeowners claims. Right? You make constant homeowners claims about little things. Sooner or later, your rates are going to get unimaginable. Now, last point there, we're the third bullet point. Homeowners insurance coverage typically excludes vacant properties. They won't. If they know a property is vacant, insurance companies won't insure them. And I think there's some obvious reasons there, right? When you see a vacant property, first of all, nobody's maintaining it. Second of all, nobody's there to babysit it. If there's something that goes wrong inside that property, there's nobody there to stop it. Who's going to stop the people? Who's going to stop the vandalism? Who's going to stop, you know, vagrancy, things of that nature? There's nobody to do that. The insurance company will not cover vacant properties. If it's unoccupied, so let's say you have two homes. You have one, you, you know, you live down here six months of the year and you live up in Canada six months of the year. If you have two months, if you have two properties, you could probably get unoccupied property because it looks like it's lived in a bit, but not if it's vacant, right? Unoccupied property would probably still have furniture in it, things of that nature. It might give the eye of somebody being there. You probably pay a premium also, but home, uh, vacant properties will not hold, right? Will not hold. Before I get there, if you decide that you have a mortgage and you do not want to pay insurance, homeowners insurance, you decide to let it lapse. I'm not paying it anymore. Your mortgage company will do something called a forced placement. Now, I promise you that they're going to give you homeowners insurance and they're going to bill you for it. But they're not shopping for the best price, right? You're going to pay for it and you're going to pay for it through the nose. A lot of times they just go straight to Lloyd's of London, which is probably one of the most expensive insurance policies you can buy. And they're going to place it on your house and you're going to have to pay for it or they're going to call your mortgage. Remember when we were talking about mortgages, those things that we had to do? We had to maintain the property. We had to have insurance on it. We had to let them know if um, we were going to make any improvements. We couldn't destroy it, right? All of those things that, in addition to making our payments, those are all part of your mortgage. If you shut your insurance down, they're going to force place it. And if you refuse to pay it, they're going to call your mortgage in. If it's not paid, it would be a lien but they're going to make you pay it. And it won't be a lien for long because what will happen is um, you'll just not make the payments. And the very first payment that you miss, they'll what? Accelerate your payments, right? They'll put out that acceleration clause and they'll do it. Do um, They'll actually do a, a sale. Just have a sale for it. And they'll take your, their house back, right? Because that's what you, you gave them. You gave them the deed of trust. All they have is the power sale clause. They sell it out from other units. So they do have the upper hand, right? It would be a lean short period until you paid it back up, but then it would, they just accelerate it. The power of sale, all I got to do is go to auction, it's gone. Let's say we're going to go to a closing and the buyer wants to move in a week early or the seller wants to stay an extra week after the closing. If that's the case, we have to make sure that the seller, make sure your seller does not cancel their insurance until after they leave. And if they leave before the closing, after the closing. Because if it gets extended, if, if your closing gets delayed, you do not want that house to be without insurance. If the seller, if this closing gets delayed and that house goes on fire and they haven't closed, who's responsible? The seller is still responsible. So you want them to hold that insurance, cancel it the day after closing, after you have the closing, but hold the insurance until the last minute. Do not cancel it before you close and get your money. Okay, because you're going to be responsible up until then. If the buyer's moving in, the buyer wants to get renter's insurance early and then let them, their date. It's okay to have it double insured. This is a messy issue when we do buyer before closing or seller after closing possession. Um, it gets to be messy and things happen. Accidents happen. People discover things that weren't disclosed, all of those things. 
So it can be sticky. All right. We want to make sure the insurances on both sides are taken care of. Um, listing agents should advise sellers to verify continued uh, appropriate insurance coverage of listed property through the closing and recordation. Make sure. Make sure it's recorded. Then cancel the insurance. You can cancel it, you know, the very next day. It's okay. Nobody get hurt. Let's talk about flood insurance. You buy flood insurance, not through your insurance company. Well, you'll buy it through them as a conduit, but all flood insurance is sold through FEMA and, they're, and they're, they have the National Flood Insurance Policy, NFIP. And that's who handles all of the flood insurance policies. And those are subsidized currently. So when you buy a flood insurance policy, the government's paying for a little bit of that, okay? The best thing you could do if you're buying a new house is to see if your seller already has a flood insurance policy. And if they do, you can take it over and you're going to get a little increase in premium, maybe 15 or, you know, it could be up to 20% because some of the subsidies are going away. But the problem is if you don't, if they don't have it and you got to buy a new policy for that property, you could see it go up three and 400 times, right? Because all of the subsidies will have gone away. So at any particular point, you need flood insurance. See if the owners already have one and see if you can have it transferred into their need. It's got to go up a little bit, but you're going to save yourself a lot of money by doing that. Mm -hmm. You go to your um, insurance company and you say, I need flood insurance. They're going to figure out what it's going to cost. They're going to go to the NFIP. They're going to buy this insurance. And then you're going to get flood insurance, all right? So this National Flood Insurance Act of 1968 Administered by FEMA, Federal Emergency Management or um, Associate or Agency, right? Federal Emergency Management Agency, and subsidizes these flood insurance. They pay some for some of this. All right. Um, the intent is to reduce the impact of flooding on private and public uh, structures, encourage community floodplain managements, and provide affordable insurance. But it's going away. Those, those things are going away. Right. So it wants, because they're so expensive, they want communities to look at maybe drainage issues, maybe backfilling some of the low areas, you know, any kind of regulation. If you have a beach house, make sure that you have a vet water evacu evacuation chutes that go out if the water comes up underneath you, right? So it comes in and goes out. So they're looking at construction and everything else that goes with that, all right? All of those things are part of that, all right? Makes it better. Down the road, less destruction. All federally related mortgage loans require flood insurance on property located in FEMA designated flood zone. So if your bank, if you have a flood, if you're in one of the FEMA designated flood zones, you need to have flood insurance. Now, also, if you are in one of those flood zones and you need flood insurance, the bank will not let you pay it on their own, on your own. The bank will require that you escrow the money monthly with them and they will pay it. Okay. Because it's mandatory that you have this flood insurance, particularly with the bank. So you can pay, most people can pay if you wanted to, your taxes and your insurance without escrowing it with the bank. It's just easier to give them the money. In the event of this um, property, right, they must escrow it. They must escrow it. Have to. Location in a FEMA designated flood zone of any part of the property is a material fact, and it's all included. And there's the link. If you want to know what kind of flood zone you're in, you can go to FEMA.gov or you can go to uh, NC Flood and find out and they'll tell you. Now, you don't necessarily have to be on the beachfront to be in a flood zone or a riverfront to be in a flood zone. It all depends on how the rainwater drains. I can point it to a community that's not far from here that literally is probably three miles from the ocean and another two miles from the river. But what happens is it's low line. So all of the runoff from all these other communities happens to go there, right? Happens to go there. Yeah, Florence, just everything was flooded, right? There's not much you could do about that. And again, it doesn't, if, just make sure, all right, even though you're nowhere near a beach or a lake or a river, it depends on how the water run after a heavy rain. If you arrive, three communities run into your property, run into your neighborhood, you could be in a higher zone. 
And these zones are changing all the time. They're in a constantly, constant flux. They're still changing these things all the time. So I couldn't tell you one part or another. You'd have to check the zoning maps, right? Yeah, if only a corner of your house is in the zone and then you have to have it. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Doesn't matter. Just a tiny bit, right? Yeah, Florence is just a water dumper. It was just a water dumper. Dumper Matthew before it, where all the trees fell down and everything else, um, that was ugly too. But more of tree damage than water damage. Florence was just a soaker. So we live close to these water. We live close to the water. That's what we do. That's the penalty we play. Would a flood affect the value of the land? Yeah, probably. Depends on how long it stayed. Depends on any changes in topography. Depends on whether you have good drainage or bad drainage, right? Whether they want to deal with it. Yeah, it could. Although you know what the prices of houses on the beachfront are. They get premium pricing and they flood, right? They're in a flood zone. They're in a high zone. Not that it should, it could, because the next slide is going to tell us about this. We hear about these 100-year floodplains all the time. And people think that this thing is only going to flood once every 100 years. That is not the truth. This 100-year floodplain refers to a flood having a 1% chance of equaling or exceeding the map elevation in any given year, not a flood that occurs every 100 years. So we have a 1% chance every single year of having a flood at that property. And I've seen 100-year floodplains um, have three or four years of flooding in them. Okay, just because of the heavy rains, the weather is going to dictate that. That's what it means. That 100-year floodplain means it has a 1% chance of equaling or exceeding the map uh, flood map, which means we can get water. It's not much chance. It's pretty low lying, but it doesn't mean it's not, not uh, if, it, if it floods in 2023, it doesn't mean that it's not going to flood in the, for another 100 years. That's not the case at all. Could flood again the year after. It just depends on the weather. If you like this video, feel free to share it with a friend. For more real estate education content, please subscribe to the channel. From all of us at Seacoast Real Estate Academy, thank you for watching.